Okay, welcome to uh, Sharks of the Oregon Coast. I'm Paul Norman. I'm a volunteer at the Friends of Neatarts Bay Webs. And um, this uh, this particular presentation, I'm not sure if it's our presenter, Taylor, or Sharks, but uh, it's set a new record for signups for our virtual program. So, uh, and it's, it should be very good. Uh, again, just, you already know this, but just a reminder, it, Things work a lot better if you keep your microphone muted and your camera off. Um, we will be recording this so we can uh, share it later with folks who are interested. Um, as we go along, if you have questions, please use the, uh, the chat function to pose your question. And um, Roger Miller will be monitoring that. And we'll probably save most of the questions for the end of uh, uh, Taylor's presentation, just uh, so we don't inter interrupt the flow too much. Um, so, uh, and when our executive director, Chrissy Smith, is going to uh, do a brief introduction of uh, WEBS, our organization, but uh, oh, there you are, Chrissy. So, if, Chrissy, if you'll give folks a really brief introduction to WEBS, that would be great. Yeah, we're very excited with um, everyone who signed up. We see a lot of really new names, so it's always great to um, to see that when that happens. Um, so my name is Chrissy, and I'm the executive director for the Friends in East Tarts Bay Watershed Estuary Beach and Sea, which we lovingly infect <laughs> abbreviate to WEBS. Um, our goal is to sustain the East Tarts Bay area through education and stewardship. So um, the way we do that is we work really hard um, to fundraise through grants and private donations to, um, to bring educational opportunities like this one um, to the public. And so we typically offer during non-COVID times um, 40 public programs that get people out and about uh, learning about the natural environments and how to be a good steward of this place. Uh, we have a lot of people visit here. We wanna make sure that we're sharing with them how to how to explore safely and responsibly and how to appreciate this place for, for what it offers. Uh, we also wanna do the same for our youth. So we offer a handful of, uh, we sponsor a handful of education programs through the K, for K through 12 that are very hands-on inquiry-based STEM programs. Um, and, um, and that's what we hope to do is kind of instill at an early age and all through um, your life, ways that you can enjoy and appreciate this place um, that we call home. Um, and then uh, this, this particular program is also uh, part of the Explore Nature series, which is something that we um, help to create and are, are currently a partner on. Uh, if you wanna learn more about Explore Nature, the website is on the screen right now. There's a number of great events happening with that, with, with various different organizations in Tillamook County as well. Um, yeah, so that's Friends of Neatarts Bay. Our, our email's on the screen, our website's on the screen. It's all very easy to find, neatartsbaywebs.org. Um, we hope that you will learn more and I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. Okay. Thanks, Chrissy. And uh, a number of you uh, made donations when you signed up. We really appreciate that. We'll, we'll put that to good use. So thanks, thanks a bunch for that. Um, we're really lucky to have with us Taylor Chapel. Uh, Today, he's an assistant professor at Oregon State University. He has a background in population modeling of white sharks and other types of sharks. Very focused on spreading the word that there is uh, more to sharks than just pointy teeth. And he's been really worked all over the world, literally helping folks uh, think differently about, uh, about these creatures. So uh, great to have you, Taylor. And I think we'll uh, turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Thank you, Paul and Chrissy. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, and thank you all for uh, for being here tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, do y'all do you see that? All right, yeah. good. Make sure I don't get any gray gray boxes in there. Um, well, great. That's uh, Paul. Sort of introduced me. I am I'm I'm fairly new to the the Oregon coast here. I've I've been in California for the previous about ten years um, in in Monterey, uh, in, in about seven before that in Davis. So I've I've been along the west coast for a long time, but sort of new to Oregon. Um, but the creatures that I study aren't, and so that's 
what I want to talk about tonight. And um, if there's if there's questions about clarity, if things aren't clear, or you have a question with a specific topic, feel free to stop me. Um, but if they're sort of overarching or general questions, um, if you can hold those to the end, I, I warned Paul that if you get me started in the middle of the talk, I might not stop until tomorrow morning. So um, uh, do stop me if it's if you want some some points of clarification. But really, what I want to do is is talk about these amazing predators that we have in our backyard. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a few of the species, uh, but really primarily focus on white sharks, which I've been studying for the, about uh, the past 15 years um, in various places across our West Coast, East Coast, and in South Africa as well. So this is probably the first image that comes to you, many of our minds when you hear the word shark. Um, this is as you all are probably very familiar with this iconic photo um, cover from Jaws and this idea that there was this, this denizen of the deep that was coming up to, to eat the unsuspecting swimmer at the surface. And that, that sharks are just these giant eating machines and they are have sharp teeth and they jump out of the water and anything that touches the water or swimming pool is going to get eaten by one of these ravenous sharks. But the truth of the matter is that that that's not how it works. They are incredible predators and they're really important to our ecosystems, but they are not sort of the, I, I guess, the mindless killers that they've been made out to be. Uh, and in truth, more people die globally from selfies, from taking selfies than, from, than get attacked by sharks. Um, and so uh, I don't, or have not, I don't watch a lot of TV, but, but as far as I know, there is not an entire week on Discovery Channel that is dedicated to ways to die with selfies. Um, but there are with sharks. Uh, and so, so my goal is to sort of change that perception of, of what these animals are and how we interact with them and how important they are to us. Because in truth, the way that we are more likely to interact with a shark uh, is in a negative way for the animals. And so these are just a few of the ways that um, humans affect sharks. This top picture is, is a shark fishing boat down off of um, Louisiana that I was doing, uh, I was an observer on. So I was taking biological samples from these animals. Um, so they'd have a, you know, decks full of, of sharks. And so there's uh, upwards of 70, 100, 120 million animals a year that are taken um, either as bycatch, which means incidental catch or targeted for their fins. So on that bottom right, you see a, a bowl of shark fin soup, uh, which is one of the leading um, causes for, for shark death, uh, that their, their fins are basically they're made out of this cartilaginous noodle and that's turned into a soup. Um, and then there's a few other examples, shark cartilage pills and other beauty products. So the reality is there's a handful, uh, usually under 10 people globally that die from shark attacks, but there's hundreds of millions um, of sharks that die from people each year. So uh, that's my that's my little soapbox to start with. Uh, so now I want to start talking a little bit more about um, about the animals that we have here off of our Cal or this is um, the Northern California current. So off of the Oregon coast. Um, and so we think about the two webs that we have here. Uh, if you if you wanted to imagine what was happening in the ocean, I think a lot of us would start with salmon. Salmon being this ubiquitous, really important species uh, to you know to to our economy, to culture, to religion, all sorts of things here. And so, if we were to base the system here on, on salmon and think about well, what things are eating salmon? Well, we'd say orcas, right? So the southern resident killer whales um, that are coming down and uh, in, in feeding on the salmon. Uh, we also know that the other marine mammals, so these are harbor seals that are that are eating a, a salmon as well. Uh, and then smolts as they're as they're out migrating out of the rivers uh, are predated upon by uh, by birds. Um, and then if you want to look at another major predator, you'd look at us. So uh, that's my wife and I last year out out salmon fishing. And so if we were to draw a very simplified sort of food web in the way that we've historically thought about, uh, the ecosystems uh, here, it would start, if you had salmon as, as the focus here, it would start with these sort of four main predators. But my argument, which I will try to talk about a little bit tonight, is that there's a, it, it's much more complex than these, these sort of mammals and these seabirds that are predating on salmon. And in, in fact, there's, there's three major species of coastal sharks 
that are likely really important predators or really important players in the health of our coastal systems, but we don't know a whole lot about them here. Um, we use information from other places. Uh, so that's the broadnose seven gill shark, the white shark, which um, many of you might know as a great white. It's the same thing, but we try to we've tried to downplay the great part of it to sort of demystify the scary Hollywood vibe of great white. So you'll hear me say white shark, um, but it's that iconic species that that we're all familiar with. Uh, and then another species called the salmon shark. So just a little bit of background about the broadnose seven gill. Um, it is uh, an ectothermic predator, and that becomes important uh, as I talk about salmon sharks and white sharks because they're the opposite. So ectothermic means that they are, they're basically the same temperature as the water around them. So the same way that a, a snake is the same temperature and they'll sit on rocks to warm up or a lizard, <clears throat> these sharks are ectothermic. And so they, they are, their metabolism basically moderated by the water around them. Uh, and that becomes important again, as we talk about, um, uh, about white sharks and salmon sharks later. They get to about three meters maximum length. Um, and what's really cool about them is they are, they're a very important predator. They can hunt individually, but they can also hunt cooperatively to take down larger marine mammal prey. Uh, so things like elephant seals, um, sorry, not elephant, sorry, harbor seals. Um, getting all my marine mammals mixed up. So harbor seals, they can work together and cooperatively take down a harbor seal. Um, and so being ectothermic, they're not quite as, um, is, they don't have quite the metabolic scope. They can't be as quick and, and agile as a marine mammal um, because they don't have a warm body, but they can work together. So that's a really cool, unique characteristic of them. And they reside seasonally inside bays, basically during the spring and the summer, um, which coincides with that peak time of harbor seals uh, in those areas. So the bays off of our coasts, um, you know, Coos Bay, Tillamook, Willapa, Grace Harbor, um, those are all really important places for these animals. And so those are also really important places for out migrating or in migrating salmon, uh, green sturgeon. Um, and so they're this very sort of voracious predator that are living in those, those same waters um, with those different species of fish. One of the other species that we have off our coast is called the salmon shark. Um, as you can imagine from the name, uh, it feasts heavily on salmon. Um, the really interesting characteristics about these sharks is that they are, they're in this, this uh, family uh, called lamnids. Uh, and lamnid sharks are salmon sharks, poor beagles, white sharks, and mako sharks. And what makes them unique, as I hint, sort of mentioned before, is that they are warm bodied. So they can actually heat their, um, they can heat their brain, they can heat their eyes, and they can heat their, their viscera, basically their sort of digestive system. Um, and that's really unique in the marine world because water basically sucks your energy out, of, or sorry, sucks your heat out about 25 times faster than air. So it's really costly if you're an animal in the ocean that is, uh, that is endothermic. Um, that's why marine mammals uh, that are in the water have big, thick blubber layers or really um, impenetrable fur like an otter does. But sharks don't have that. They have a different sort of technique, which is they put their, their um, red muscles or the, sort of the heat producing muscle on the inside and the white muscle on the outside. But I won't get into that. So there's only a few species um, in the oceans besides these lamnids that do warm their body, bluefin tuna, yellowfin tuna, and pompano. But it's a really cool adaptation because what it does is it allows them to be uh, a really active predator in really cold waters. So they can be up in the Bering Sea, um, up in Alaska, and uh, feeding on fast moving salmon. Um, so it allows them to have this, this so we, what we call more uh, uh, a larger metabolic scope. So they can, they can be really active when it's really cold. Um, and uh, basically they, they range from the Bering Sea down to Baja on the US uh, North Pacific. Um, and then from the Bering Sea down to Japan, the South of Japan on the West side. And from what we know uh, in Alaska, uh, they are a very significant consumer of salmon. They take about somewhere between 12 and 25% of the total annual runs of the, the returning Pacific salmon up there. So a very important predator for salmon uh, up in Alaska. But again, we don't really know anything about these uh, animals. No one has, has, has targeted salmon sharks for any research, 
um, down here at all. So that's uh, what my lab and my work at, at, at OSU is doing is trying to understand the role that these predators play in our ecosystems. And this is a, these are just two figures. So we had, so we done some work up in Alaska, up in Prince William Sound on these salmon sharks to look at where they're going. We've done it there because there was more easily uh, access to animals. And so Prince William Sound, if you can see my cursor is sort of up in the top here. I guess I'll get rid of that figure on the side first. And these lines are all uh, satellite positions from these sharks. We put tags on their dorsal fins. And I think actually, if we go back, you can see on this shark that we're, the salmon shark that we're crating and back in the water in Prince William Sound, um, it's got a series of tags on its dorsal fin. So that those tags tell us where the animal is over a period of time. And you can see all these blue dots were locations. Um, and the green ones are what we considered foraging. So basically the sharks were swimming around more often than swimming in a straight line. So it just gives you a sense of where the animals are going and then where foraging is occurring. So you can see there's a lot of foraging by these animals. Again, all these green um, circles is where foraging is happening by these salmon sharks. And then this figure on the right side, this is a heat plot that shows the locations of the salmon sharks. Of all the salmon sharks, about 100, 100 or so that we tagged, these, this is basically the hotter temperatures are the higher number, or higher probability of salmon sharks being there. Um, and so you can see where I am right here where that star just appeared is Newport. And so our coastline is really important for the ecology of these predators, yet we don't really know how that plays into our really you know, abundant and vibrant coastal marine systems. And so the, the, the third shark, which I'm going to get into a lot more detail about um, because we've been working with these sharks uh, in, in California for a, a long period of time are the white sharks. And I'll go through a, a little bit of background about white sharks in general before I get into uh, our research. So there are six major globally genetically distinct populations of white sharks. Um, the first going from left to right uh, on my screen uh, is the Northwest uh, Atlantic or off of our East Coast, so Cape Cod, um, Carolinas, and Florida. There's a population in the Mediterranean, uh, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, um, the Northwest Pacific, and then the Northeast Pacific where we are. And you'll notice that, that two of these are circled in blue. Those are two populations that we know are genetically distinct, but we know very little about them. Um, there hasn't been much work to understand those animals or the animals are so rare um, that it's really hard to have a, a concerted research efforts on those animals. But what we'll be talking about today is uh, most of the work that I've been doing here in the Northeast Pacific, so where we are, and then inferred some information from uh, animals that we've I've been studying uh, down in South Africa as well. So white sharks at birth, they're born about um, 1.2 to 1.5 meters, so it's about four feet long, uh, and they're live birthed. So uh, the female actually has internal eggs, the eggs hatch uh, inside the female, and then she'll give birth to um, somewhere from three to 14 live young. Um, uh, they're regional endotherms. So I mentioned this about the salmon sharks, their white sharks are the same. So they, uh, they can uh, heat their brain, they can heat their, um, their eyes, and then they can heat their viscera for digestion. They go through what we call an ontogenetic shift. And this is really important because it's a it's basically a different life stage and so when they're born at that four meter or sorry that four foot range they um are down in warm water and they have this specific dentition that's really good for feeding on squids and other sharks and fish and so that's really what the the bulk of their diet is then they go through an ontogenetic shift so, so basically it, it's it's like a it's like an uh, a size stage shift. So they go from being a small shark that's in say Southern California eating fish and squid. And then at about seven to nine feet, they transition. So they become big enough that they have a big enough body mass that they can start moving into colder water. And they can also start hunting marine mammals. And at that time their dentition changes. So their teeth go from a really pointy sort of fish catching tooth into the really serrated, um, uh, what do you call that triangular uh, teeth that we are sort of familiar with for, for white sharks. That becomes really important for the research that I'm talking about because the, the techniques that I use to study the sharks is with a decoy and with bait. And so it's really only focusing on these animals um, that are 
above that sort of that shift. So that above that seven to nine foot range. So we're in the animals that are maybe seven to about 19 or 20 feet long is the animals that I'm talking about today. They gestate somewhere between 12 and 18 months. Um, and their populations uh, is in the low hundreds to low thousands. So not, not uh, a, a huge number of these animals. Um, we have a paper that just came out a few days ago about trends um, in the populations. And what we found is that the that this, this low number, although it was surprising at first, is probably a fairly healthy population size for, for white sharks. Their maximum age is about 70 years old, uh, and they have these large scale and seasonal migrations, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and you'll notice a few of these have question marks next to them. That's basically because some of this fundamental information about white sharks, we don't know. Um, and it, it seems like you would, right? You should know how many pups they have. How big is a litter size? These are things that we fundamentally don't know that we're still trying to figure out because it is so hard to study a really big and roaming uh, predator in the ocean. So the, the work that I'm gonna talk about is, is again, mostly in California and some in South Africa. And so the, in California, um, I work in this region. This is basically the Bay Area that I have circled there. And we have three spots that, that I've been working for about 15 years. The first is Tamales Point, which is part of the Point Reyes National, um, National Seashore. It's about 25 miles north of San Francisco. Then the Farallon Islands, which are about the same distance, 25 miles west of San Francisco. And then Año Nuevo, which is a, an island that's just a few hundred meters off the coast, uh, just north of Santa Cruz. And then in South Africa, I've been working in a, in a spot called Kansvai, which um, if any of you have followed shark shows and things like that, it's a spot called Shark Alley um, between Dyer Island and Giza Rock, which is a really well-known spot for sharks to show up um, in South Africa. So the way that, that we study the animals is that we, we attract them um, and we don't do big chumming slicks and try to, uh, you know, a bunch of blood and things in the water. Basically, we, we utilize their keen sense of sight. And so we put out these uh, decoys, which are basically indoor outdoor carpet that look like a seal on the surface. And so these three spots that I've, I pointed out in California are known foraging sites for white sharks. So we're exploiting that behavior. So we put the seals decoy on the surface and the sharks come up uh, and they investigate it. We do enter a small piece of marine mammal into the water as a basically a, an extra sort of ambiance piece. Uh, so this is a, a, a sperm whale that um, was stranded and washed up on a beach in Crescent City. So we use about a two pound piece of, of meat that we get from, um, from one of these stranded animals. And we have that next to our boat. And so we don't do the big, again, the big chumming slick and big scent and bring sharks from all over the place. Basically, it turns out that sharks are really curious, but they're also really cautious. And so a shark might come up and look at the decoy, and we start reeling the decoy towards the boat. Uh, as soon as the shark sees the boat, they tend to leave. They think it's a competitor or it's something novel that they're not used to, and they take off. So they're not, they're not um, uh, just these brazen animals that are biting onto everything. They're really cautious. You don't get to be an 18-foot white shark by being overly brazen. Um, because you're going to get yourself into it. You lose an eye or something like that. You're basically signed your death, your death warrant. So these animals are cautious. So we have the little bit of, of blubber in the water that adds a, a little scent. So the shark sees the decoy, it says, it looks like what I want. Oh, it smells kind of like what I want. And it keeps them around the boat so that we can study them. So once the shark comes up to the boat, then we do a number of things. One is we take photo IDs. So I'll talk about the, the, the ID process in a second. And then we put external tags. And so that's a picture of, of me on the back of the boat a few years ago, trying to put a clamp tag on the back of this white shark, which I'll describe a little bit more. But as you can see, it's a, it's a big team of folks um, that, that make this work, uh, this work all happen. So one of the first things that I wanted to do when I started, I actually did my PhD work on white sharks off of California was to, to figure out how many were out there. Uh, and as I said, we take photographs to do photo IDs of these animals. And, and each of the, the sharks have a very unique dorsal fin. So the fin that's on their back is basically like a fingerprint. And they're conserved over you know, upwards of 30 to 35 years. And that's as long as we've known some animals. So they're really well conserved. 
And so we can take a photograph and we can identify those animals year after year as they come back. And so this is just an example of one fin that was a few years apart, but you can see all the unique notches and, and peaks and valleys in the, in the end of that fin um, are exactly the same. So you're able to identify that specific individual over time. So um, as Paul mentioned, I was, a, uh, I was trained as a population modeler. I am not gonna show you any statistics tonight. So you are in luck. I don't wanna put anybody to sleep just yet. But what I will tell you is that we came out with a population of, of white sharks in Central California being about 200 animals. Um, and we've just redone this population estimate. Uh, so this was in 2011. We've just redone this population estimate recently. And the population number is, is pretty close to the same. There's a few more animals. So this is a, a pretty robust um, uh, estimate of these animals. And, and I, we think a pretty, pretty steady population number. So that gave us an estimate of, of, uh, of the number of animals, but we wanted to know more about what the animals were doing here and just more basic biology and ecology of these animals. But our sort of historic understanding of sharks were either from catching them um, or were from an interaction like this, where a shark comes to the surface for a few seconds, we take a photograph of the fin and we take a little bit of video. Um, and then we think that we can understand what the animal is doing and everything about it. Um, it's sort of like if, if I were to, in the morning, you came downstairs and you opened up your refrigerator and I came in and snapped the photo of you um, and then said, I can tell everything that you did and everything there is to know about you by those few seconds that you were in the refrigerator. And when we think about it that way, it doesn't really work, right? There's so many other complexities that I don't get to observe about your day if I just see you at that moment at the fridge. And that's the same thing with the shark. So we have these sharks at the surface for a few seconds when we're, when we're observing them. And in the sort of the scope of an entire day, that's very little. So what we needed to be able to do, since we can't get on the back of a shark or track it in the same way that you can an elk or a bear or something like that, we needed to be able to have something that could go in the water with them. So then came the advent of the electronic tag. And there's a few different types that I'll talk about. This is called an acoustic tag. And the, the, the difficulty about water is that things like GPS or radio signals do not transfer through that air water interface. We can't put a GPS on an animal that swims underwater and get a location from it. That's why submarines have conning towers and have to come up to the surface in order to transmit um, and communicate. So we went uh, with a different route. And so we use these acoustic tags. So similar to a submarine, how they use acoustics to hear other subs and things like that, we're using acoustics to identify animals. So we put uh, a tag in the back uh, of the shark. And you can see there's two tags on the back of this animal at the bottom of the picture. Uh, and they basically just insert into the, the, the dorsal muscle. And that goes along with the shark. And every 90 seconds, it shoots an acoustic, or it makes an acoustic, unique acoustic signature. And then we have listening stations that listen for those. Um, and when it detects, it says shark 65 was off of Newport Beach last night at 10 o'clock, something like that not just circles of that acoustic tag. And what we're able to, to do by tagging a number of sharks in Central California and deploying receivers along the coast, um, able to see that they have this very predictable offshore, or sorry, very predictable, um, uh, very predictable residency period. So uh, this figure just shows on the x-axis here is years. So these are months and those are years. And these are the number of detections per day. And the colors just show the year that they were tagged. So don't worry about the colors, but just see that, the, so say in 2008 here, the peak um, uh, of time that the sharks were detected was basically it started in September, peaked in November, December, and then fell off again. So we could see that each year there were these very predictable peaks of residency of sharks along the coast. And it turns out that this is basically the peak residency time for sharks along the entire West Coast. But what you'll see here, or what you don't see here, is what those animals are doing when they're not detected by acoustic tags. So the limitation of acoustic tags is that they only transmit about 500 meters to a kilometer. And you have to have a receiver in the water that hears that and records the information. So if you don't have a receiver in the water and the shark is, or is somewhere else, those acoustic tags don't give you any information. So these tags didn't tell us anything about what these sharks were doing during the, the late, or I guess the spring to late summer times um, of any of these years. So 
in comes the second technology, which is called a satellite tag. And this is a little bit different because it's basically an onboard computer. And so it records, you put it in the, on the same way. So there's a picture of the, the tag on the back of the shark there, but this one has a temperature sensor, a depth sensor and a light sensor. And it records that information for up to about a year, then it pops off and then it transmits all of that information to a satellite and then back to us. Uh, and light level might seem a little bit odd to have, but we use that to actually estimate the location of the animal. Again, we can't do GPS underwater. So that records the, the basically the, the ambient light and old mariners used to, um, used to know how they used to have a, a clock on their boat and it would be very precise. And whenever the middle of the day, so the median point between dawn and dusk, the middle of the day was their local noon. And they know how far um, offset their local noon was from Greenwich, Greenwich mean time, so Greenwich's noon, and they could tell where they were on the globe, um, uh, east or west, by how far offset that was. So their local noon to Greenwich's local noon. We do the same thing. So we use the light level on the tag to estimate where those animals are, more or less. And what we found out, so there's periods of time where the sharks were not along the coast, um, they were actually heading way offshore. So there's a, these are the group of sharks in central California heading out, and there's another uh, part of this population off Guadalupe in Mexico. But you can see these animals head out as far as Hawaii, but the majority of them go to this spot that's in the middle of nowhere, the spot that we call the White Shark Cafe. So it was the first time that we understood that sharks were leaving the, the west coast of the U.S., this really rich California current system that has tons of productivity, tons of food, and going out to the middle of nowhere. So we got to understand a little bit about these big movements, but we wanted to know more about some of the behavior and the specific things that the animals are doing. So what are they doing along the coastline? And um, this is a, a different tag. These are called what we call biologging tags. And so instead of giving us these large scale movements, the animals are moving here or there. These actually give us really fine scale information about the behavior um, and the interactions of these animals. Uh, and so, uh, basically what this does, the same way that your cell phone has a, an accelerometer in it, that when you turn it, the screen knows how to turn, or you have a, um, your, your, your pedometer, your stepper, and your, your, your Fitbit on your watch. That's basically what these are. They're, a, they're like a souped up version of that that has a camera in it as well. So it allows us to look at the energetics, the behaviors. It can tell us instead of steps, it tells us tail beat frequencies of the animals. Um, as well as a bunch of, uh, of uh, sort of environmental factors. And this is a, just a picture of, or a video um, of putting these tags on. So this is uh, me in the orange there. And you'll see that the sharks come up towards the side. This is South Africa. And it clamps onto the dorsal fin and the shark swims off. So now that shark will spend the next, next few days to about a week with that tag clamped on its back. It's basically a modified clothespin that after that, after a few days will fall off um, and then we have to go pick it up. Um, but you can see it's really non-invasive. The animals just keep swimming around. And so we start to understand a little bit more of their, their real behavior. So we're not modifying them. We're not catching them. We're not doing anything. We're, we're putting a tag on um, that doesn't seem to bother them at all. And then following and learning about what they do. And We've learned a lot about what we didn't know. Um, I, you, you likely, many of us are familiar with the types of shows that we see on TV where sharks are, white sharks are breaching out of the water and eating seals. And that's how we thought that the majority of their, of their predation style was. Um, in, in any of you that were our abalone divers or um, uh, scuba divers, we've, we've heard this sort of mantra that the kelp is a refuge and that sharks don't go into kelp. Um, and things like that. But what we found out by actually having tags on the back of animals is that, that that wasn't true. And sharks actually do hunt in the kelp. So you'll see some bubbles, you'll see some seals drop down on the sides here. There's two more on the bottom. They blow bubbles up at the shark. Uh, and it turns out that the sharks are actually actively hunting in the kelp. Uh, and it's a different strategy. They will swim around in the kelp. They will corral the seals into some of the kelp patties and then wait for the seals to become distracted or go up to breathe before they pursue them. So very different behavior. We would have never seen this from the surface if we weren't able to go on board uh, with the animals themselves to understand how they're interacting with their environment and how they're interacting with different prey species. And this is just a, a quick figure of, of, 
of what that those data look like. So the black line here is the track made of the shark underwater. Um, blue is where it was outside of the kelp and green was inside the kelp. And then the red stars are places that it saw seals. And so you can see that this shark spends over a five minute period, almost the entire time inside the kelp and is pursuing and interacting with seals in the kelp. So very different behaviors than we were able to, to see before because we're able to be underwater with these animals. Uh, but what's really cool, so for those of you that are, 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 are now worried that sharks go into kelp and you always thought you could be in kelp, well, it turns out that sharks basically feed very, very seldomly. So we had cameras on animals for about, about 400 hours. Uh, and of, of those 400 hours, 450 hours, there was one predation in that entire event. Um, and that uh, was on a hagfish. Um, so if any of you know what a hagfish is, it's basically a slime meal. Uh, and they have, I think they have about 60 calories um, uh, per hagfish. So not exactly a bountiful meal for a white shark. So uh, we have a few other methods that we've looked at, at feeding behavior, which I, I'm not gonna have time to get in tonight, but basically sharks are feeding very, very rarely, uh, you know, maybe once every three or four weeks is, is what the um, sort of what the rate would be. So um, another reason to, to not be terrified of these just mindless predators that are eating everything. It turns out that they're, they're very choosy uh, with what they eat and when they eat. So we know a little bit about what they're doing on the coast and we know that they're feeding, but not very often. Um, but we know these, these aggregation sites are normally for foraging. So what is it that's going on in the cafe, in the offshore area that's drawing the sharks out? Is it actually, that's the spot that they're doing most of their foraging and they just eat a little bit here or are they doing something else? And so we came up, the reason we called it the cafe is because we came up with two leading hypotheses about why the sharks were going there. The first was that there was uh, better food out there. So there's better food that they're eating. The second was that there's a different resource that they actually are mating offshore. So that's the resource that they're leaving the California current to go to. So we wanted to start looking into those two different hypotheses. So it's really hard to get out of the cafe. So we wanted to try to understand it and what the sharks were doing without going there. So we looked at what's called stable isotopes and sort of in a very brief way, um, you are what you eat. And so what you eat and where you eat shows up in the isotopic signature in your body. So basically these heavy elements. So you probably all have heard of like carbon dating, carbon 13, um, that's carbon 13 is an isotope of carbon. And so different processes create different isotopes of like nitrogen, different isotopes of carbon, but those are different on different places on the, on the planet. So, so let's take this sort of this cartoon here. So if you were a shark that was eating on the coast, you rep your, your isotopes, uh, in your muscles, in your tissues represent that you eat on the coast. So you, uh, we'll call the coast shark green. So it looks, the food on the coast is green. So the shark, its isotopic signature looks green. If you're a shark <coughs> that feeds in Hawaii, it has a different isotopic signature. It's blue because that's the type of, of isotopes that are available there. If you're a shark that feeds between those two places in the cafe, then you're going to be a mix of that. You're sort of a bluish greenish color. It'd be easier if it was yellow and red, yellow and blue and it made green, but you get the idea. It's a mix of those colors in the middle. And that's sort of what we're doing with isotopes. So we take a small piece of muscle and we can look at what the signature is um, of, of what the isotope's signature is. So the first thing is we need to know what the isotope's signature of the area is that we think the shark should go into. And then we have to look at the isotopic signature of the shark and figure out which of those areas it matches up. So that's exactly what we did. So we took a bunch of prey species and we looked at their isotopic signature, prey species from those locations. So the ones here in blue are all the animals that we got from the pelagic. And this is, the pelagic is, means basically open ocean. So this would be animals that are in the cafe and they're represented by blue here. And this is the, what their isotopic signatures were. Animals in Hawaii were the red and then the animals in the California currents are green. So if you were a white shark that was feeding on only California food, you would be green. Only, only food in the cafe, you would be blue. Or if you were feeding on a little bit of both, you'd be sort of in the middle. That's where that, that circle is supposed to represent. 
But what we found out is when we actually looked at the, the data from the sharks is that they were much closer to California. So that indicated that the sharks are not eating a ton when they're offshore. The majority of their eating, that's once every couple of weeks um, that's happening on the coast, is that is the bulk of their energy intake. Their annual energy intake is in California. Um, and it's very, it's, it's very uh, sparse feeding. So they're not going off to the cafe for some incredibly rich resource. So a different way that we came at it and said, all right, well, they're, they're not eating much out there. So what is it that they're, that they're doing? And we were able to use some of the, the data from those satellite tags to start to understand it. So I'm going to step back into a little bit of sort of like uh, theoretical physiology or theoretical behavior, energetics. So if, if you all have ever watched a bird, watched a swallow or um, basically any bird that's traversing different locations, you'll notice that they flap up and then they glide and they flap up and they glide. And it's a very indicative behavior um, that's that's conserved um, in marine mammals and it's conserved in sharks. The same thing. So the sharks and marine mammals will swim up and then they'll glide down and swim up and glide down. Um, and that's a way to conserve energy. It's a really efficient way to move. And so we see that in white sharks as they are transiting um, from the California coast or the Oregon coast out to the cafe. But when they get to the cafe, that behavior completely changes. And so this is a figure um, that, that shows what we call vertical velocity. So this, this time from like, so if you look on the X axis here, that's there's dates so that starts in five November through August. And then this is just the vertical velocity. So vertical, just the straight up and down velocity. And so basically November through March is the time where they're doing this, like they're, they're basically slowly gliding down and they're moving and they're pedaling up and they're slowly gliding down. But you'll see when they get into April through July, that's the peak time where those sharks are in the middle of the cafe. And they're basically swimming up and down really, really fast. So they're doing something very unusual, very different. And the cool thing about this is that it is only the males that do this. The males and females are in the same place, but only the males are doing this specific behavior. And what we think is that that is actually has something to do with the mating process. Uh, and I'll give you a, a little bit of a sort of a explanation of that. Um, so the ocean is, is layered. It's, it's basically like pancakes. And so the different water masses don't necessarily mix with each other. So it, the water might be stratified because of temperature or salinity or some other character. So instead of, instead of like if you dropped some dye in the water, it wouldn't mix all over the place. Basically, it would mix within that, that pancake layer. So, yeah, so if you imagine that, that the ocean is the plate of pancakes um, and each of those pancake pancakes is a different layer of water. Um, so sharks are known to emit pheromones in terms to, to, to signal sexual readiness. Um, we don't know if that's the case in white sharks, but it, it, does, it is in other sharks. So we think that's probably likely in white sharks. So a female is going to release this chemical in the water. It's not going to go all over the place. It's going to go horizontally in that, in that pancake layer. So if she wants a male to be able to find it, or a male wants to be able to find it, he has to cut down that in those pancakes and up out of those pancakes as, as often as many times as he can in order to find it. So it's sort of like if, if you took those pancakes and I put syrup on one pancake and smacked them all together, the only way that you're guaranteed to get a bite of syrup is if you take a bite of all the layers at the same time. So the same thing for shark. If that shark can swim down those layers and up as fast as it can, it, it'll more, it's more likely to find the pheromone from the female than if it just swam in the top two layers horizontally really slowly. So we do think it, it has something to do with, uh, with the mating process, but we're still working on it. So the cameras and tags that we've been applying, the biologging tags on the coast, we're trying to adapt to, to actually function it in the cafe so that we can pick this up. But you know, there's a lot of big technical event, uh, obstacles to that and things as small as keeping the lens on a camera clean for the six months while the shark swims out to the cafe. So it is a really difficult question to, to start to answer. Um, but we think we're starting to get some of the, the insights. So this is just that, that summary. So the, the, on the coast, the, the sharks are eating, although it's not that often. They're the, basically 
most the majority of their foraging is happening along the coast, uh, and then they're heading offshore with what we think is to uh, is to breed. Uh, and this is just a summary of that. That the other parts that um, basically shark attacks globally are very small. There's a there's a slight increase, but that's more has it has to deal with the number of us in the water than it does to the number of sharks in the water. You know, sharks are being basically uh, killed in, in in the numbers of tens to uh, you know over 100 million of animals a year. Um, white sharks along the west coast are in a really low, probably in the the hundreds, the low thousands. Um, they're seasonally here, basically in the fall to, to early winter, um, and they're along the coast to feed and offshore to, to mate. Um, at least that's that's what we think anyway. Um, and I, if I have a, Paul, do I have a couple more minutes? I just wanted to show one more really cool um, marine mammal thing, if that's- yeah, go, if, go for it, Taylor. Okay, I'll be, I'll be quick. I know folks have lots of things, but um, this is a really cool study that of ours that just came out last year, and I thought it's really um, would be be fun to show because it's about marine mammals, it's about orcas and, and white sharks. Um, and so this is a figure on the right side of the the distribution of three different species of animals. So the, in the blue is uh, elephant seals, in the green is white sharks, and then in the gray are orcas. Uh, and on the left side, that just shows that same distribution, um, but it shows the, the seasonality of it. So we see that um, basically in uh, September, oops, sorry, summer, September, October, November, the orcas are there, the white sharks are there, and the elephants are there. Sorry, the elephant seals, not the elephants, just the elephant seals um, are all there at that same time. And so this creates a really interesting um, uh, sort of um, food web structure that we we're able to observe uh, a few years ago. And we know that there's three different ecotypes of killer whales. There's the, there's the resident killer whales that are the salmon eaters. There's transient killer whales that are um, your marine mammal eaters. And then there's these offshores. And the offshores are super cool because they are actually, they're shark eaters. And if you look at their dentition on this top picture, you can see that they're ground down basically from the, the really tough um, skin of the sharks. So these are these animals specialize in hunting sharks, deep water sharks mostly. And um, in California, we have one of these spots we have at Farallon Islands is a spot where all three of these species sometimes overlap. Um, and, and so this, the, the figure on the right is just shows the, the orange dots that that's California, green dots, um, the green color is Tomales Bay, and then the blue is Anya Nueva. So again, those three spots I showed before. Um, and on the left here is what the what the detections per day from August to March look like uh, generally. This is what they look like pretty much every year. So in, for the Farallon Islands, for example, they sort of start in August, and the, most of the sharks are there in October, November, and then they sort of trail off. Um, Anya Nueva was a little bit slower, it sort of peaks in December. And so that's what a general trend of any given year usually looks like with shark presence at the Farallon Islands. But what happened in 2009 is that a pod of killer whales came through um, that are known to be shark eaters. Um, and the day that those animals showed up, basically all of the sharks left. So if this is, this is 2009, and if you look, this is what it, this is what the shark presence looked like. So there was about 18 sharks at the Farallon Islands. The orcas showed up right here and all of the sharks left. They just completely vanished. Some of them went to, some went to the coast, some of them went other places. None of them came back the entire following year. I'm sorry, that the entire rest of that year. Um, but we do know that they all survived. So the, the orcas were able to displace them um, but did not actually kill them. And so these are individual data, that, that same thing I showed before, but the individual sharks. So this is, this is the time, um, days since the killer whale showed up. Um, so this is, the orange here is the detections before the killer whale showed up at the Fairlawns. And these are all the different sharks. So there were, um, I guess there were 19 sharks that we have here. So uh, 19 sharks, all of them showing up all the time, every day for, a lot of times the day the orcas showed up for about an hour and a half and all of the sharks left and you can see some of them went to other places. So that's really important because it, it 
it basically you have this massive predator that thinks it's being the apex predator white shark, but it's actually been displaced by orcas. And then that has cascading effects because the elephant seals no longer are being eaten by white sharks. So they can basically do whatever they ever they want to do without risk of predation. Um, and then the white sharks, because they were displaced, they had to go somewhere else. So it changes the feeding pressure in other places. So it's these really cool dynamics um, uh, of these really top predators uh, that we're, we're, we're just starting to understand a bit better. So um, this is a sort of a summary slide to show some of the work that other projects and things that, that I do. Um, obviously these are not on the, uh, the Oregon coast. That's a giant bluefin tuna in the middle and mantas and whale sharks and, and some marlin and things. But the same type of work uh, sort of all over the globe trying to understand animals, animal movements. Um, there's a couple shows that we've done um, with Discovery, and I have I, I don't usually um, sort of plug Discovery, but these were actual science shows, um, and so they were really awesome opportunities to actually learn something and not just be scared uh, by Shark Week, um, or or I think made dumber by watching Shark Week sometimes. Um, and then there's a couple resources. Um, my webpage up on the left there. <clears throat> um, you can search for me or these are the other spots. You can learn more about some of the salmon shark tagging or white shark work that we've done. There's also uh, on my webpage, um, Sea Grant has been uh, incredibly kind and let me use their beautiful uh, sharks of the uh, Oregon coast guide. So if you ever see a shark, you can go there and you can identify it and there's a place to report it to me. And that way I can keep track of the animals that, that folks are seeing and when they're seeing them. Um, that's just my page. If there's more information that you want or, or um, ever have questions or learn more about the research that we do, um, feel free to jump on that page. It's the Big Fish Lab. Um, I also have Instagram, which I keep up with all the, the, the different research that we're doing. Um, tons of people to thank, uh, but very much want to want to thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks for, for having me. So uh, with that, if, if folks want to stick around for a bit, I'm happy to answer some questions. Yeah, that was amazing, Taylor. Thanks. Thanks so much. That was just an incredible uh, bunch of information. And um, Roger, did you want to pose? We, we had a few questions to for you, Taylor. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got a few here for you, Taylor. Um, Lisa asks, uh, with global warming and El Nino, El La Nina, are you seeing more warm water sharks on the Oregon coast? And if so, do you think bull sharks will migrate here at some point? Um, so we are seeing, so um, some of my colleagues just published a paper that uh, about this basic expanding niche. So the expanding range of juvenile white sharks has gone from Southern California, basically Santa Barbara and South is where they're typically found. Um, but they've started to show up in Monterey Bay um, pretty heavily for the past about six years. So we are already seeing a northward shift of some of these species. Um, we may start to see a northward shift of the adults as well. Um, so we might see more presence of them, uh, white sharks here. Uh, and we're, we're right now I'm working to get an acoustic array that's along the coast to start to detect that as they start to move up more, more often. Um, in terms of bull sharks, I would not expect that we will see bull sharks anytime soon. Um, that, you know, the temperature changes that we're likely to see um, aren't likely to be big enough to, uh, to be optimal habitat for bull sharks or tiger sharks or sharks in that sort of, in, in that realm. Those are all, um, you know, the ectothermic as well. Um, and I think the water here is a bit, bit still going to be a bit too cold for them. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Jill asks, would you assume that Oregon coast white sharks mimic the same travel behaviors as California based whites? So, um, yes, we expect so. So one of the figures I didn't show, um, is some of the animals that, that we've been tagging down in California, um, have, have come up here. They've come up, uh, we had receivers in Port Orford. They came through Port Orford. Um, actually, the, they've been seeing all the, we've had tags pop up, up off Westport and off of the Olympic Peninsula. So they, they do make their movements up here. Whether the animals that are up here are sort of the, the fringe ends of the sort of the, um, the range of the 
white sharks that are focused in Central California or they're a different subgroup. We don't know. But the, my expectation is they probably make the same movements, but we don't know. So um, there was a uh, last late, or I guess it was late winter, early spring last year, um, there was a, um, a sperm whale that washed up and it had about 40, uh, um, about 50 bites out of it, uh, mm -hmm. white shark bites, which is really late in the season. Um, in the California terms, wait late in the season for sharks to be around. So um, it may be that the animals are doing something a little bit different here and sticking around a little bit longer and then make a later migration or doing something totally different. But that's what we're trying to do. Um, a lot of, I was just out uh, about a month ago, just checking the waters for sharks, having, you know, droning for them to look for them, uh, as well as going out and baiting a few places with a decoy and things to see if we can, um, we can find any of them. All right, just a, a few more here, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, let's see, Mike asks, is that population estimate uh, of the hundreds to low thousands thought to be a stable population or a population that is lower than what would be typically expected, if that is known at all? Mm -hmm. So the um, so globally, uh, there's been a number of subsequent to, to my estimate for, for Central California, there's been another number of estimates for some of these other global populations, and they're all in that same ballpark. So that's the first indication that that's, that's probably a, an appropriate number of animals. Um, we also came out with a paper just a, uh, about a week and a half ago that re-estimated with another eight years of data uh, and established a trend. And basically it looks like um, for, the, for the smaller sharks, so for like the, the sub-adults, which are sharks from about nine feet to maybe 14 or 15, they're basically staying the same. Um, and then for the adults, which are 14 and above, they might be growing just slightly, the population size or the, the of, of those animals growing just slightly. So basically the population is fairly stable if nothing else is growing a, a little bit by a handful, maybe two or three individuals a year. Uh, excellent. Uh, let's see. Craig asks, um, he says, I've been offshore roughly 30 miles and saw a shark fin 18 to 24 inches out of the water, but was not showing any of its tail. Can you determine what size and type of shark it was? Um, it depends on, depends on the season. Um, the season of the year and where it was and what else, what other things you were uh, we're out there. So there's a, there's a number of species that we have off here. So there's basking sharks, which, um, have a huge fin similar, um, that would be in that size range. Uh, they're not seen very often, but they do because I mean, the, the name says it all, they're often at the surface filter feeding. Um, so that's a big fin that you would see out of the water. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see their, their tail. Um, but outside of that, um, you know, a big white shark, but, um, yeah, 18 to 24 inches is pretty big. And that's, it's probably a good sign that that would be a basking shark would be my guess. This is a, a question probably a lot of us has. It doesn't seem like the white sharks eat a lot over a two week period. Are they malnourished? Are they malnourished? No. What turns out is that, well, one, we have to think about the food that they're eating, right? So they're not, they're, they're, they're taking, you know, giant, they're not taking giant bites of celery, right? They're taking giant <laughs> bites of these marine mammals and marine mammals have, uh, just looked at this number recently about 7,000, I think it's almost 8,000 calories per kilogram. Uh, is that right? Maybe it's an order of magnitude. Anyway, it's a ton, right? So they have this, this, this really, really energy rich food that they're eating. Um, and they have a really, uh, efficient digestion. And so they're able to basically suck all of the available nutrients and, and, and calories out of that, um, out of that whale. So I, I have, um, again, there a lot of things I wasn't able to show, but we've, we've watched sharks when they show up at the coast. Um, they're very skinny. They have, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of like a little tube. Um, and within about three weeks, a lot of them are, are sort of like, are big and, and bulky like they've, they've been able to accumulate um the the energy that quickly from what they've eaten 
So they might not eat, be eating a lot, but they're really using it really well. Paul, do we have uh, time for another question or two? Yeah, sure. Uh, I just, I'm gonna read this from Kathy. She says, excellent, Taylor. I grew up in Alaska fishing the Prince William Sound. We halibut fished with scale lines and we always caught a small shark that my dad called a sand shark. And we always released them, but I remember feeling it and its skin was like velvet going one way and a razor going the other way. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they were salmon sharks. Um, what's, so most likely they were. There's only a few different species that, that um, there's some cat sharks and things like that that are really deep water sharks in Alaska. There's um, Pacific sleeper sharks, but that no one would call those velvety. They're sort of like grainy, but it's a, it's a good chance that it was a salmon shark. They're, they're probably the, the predominant, um, you know, the predominant uh, predator or non-marine mammal predator there. So it's a pretty good chance that you saw one or saw a lot of them apparently. Uh, and that, you know, there were times, especially in Prince William Sound, um, seasonally there are, there are historically have been a lot of salmon sharks in those waters. Thank you. looks like maybe one last question here. Um, how long is the lifespan of a white shark? So, uh, white sharks were, uh, we, well, we know they at least live 70 years or so. Um, it turns out sharks are really sort of difficult to age um, because they, so fish have their otoliths, basically their, their ear bones lay down rings. And so you can, you can count those rings for a fish. Um, but so for a teleos fish, so a bony fish, but sharks are cartilaginous, they're called elasma branks. And so they don't have that, that ear bone. So what we do is we look at the, their vertebrae and they lay um, rings down sort of similar to a tree does. Um, but the problem is when you're really long, um, a long lived animal that those rings get so close together that you can't tell them apart. So we've had to use a couple different techniques in order to do it. And, um, they've actually used, um, bomb carbon. So they, they can use the, the, the radio radioactive isotopes in the, in the atmosphere from, um, from nuclear bomb testing in the forties and fifties in order to use that to age sharks. It's, it's a long process. I can tell you about another time, but anyway, so we figured out that those lived about 70 years. And interesting aside, um, Greenland sharks, which are a slow moving deep water shark, which is similar to the Pacific sleeper that's in Alaska, but Greenland sharks um, are so old that they actually use a, a protein in their eye to age them. And they found out that they're, you know, a couple hundred years old um, and don't mate till they're almost 200, I think, or something like that. So they're, they're these really old, long lived, long lived animals. Sorry, that was way more information than you asked, but uh, that was awesome. <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase this next question. There are so many interesting things about sharks. What's the uh, what amazes you the most about them? Uh, it's funny. I just got asked that yesterday, um, and it took me a minute. But I, so, it, for me, what's the coolest thing, and in, in, uh, is the the migratory precision of these animals. Um, and that's because we can put a tag on an animal uh, one day and, and it can get itself out to the cafe to the exact same spot year after year after year with no, there's no, there's, there, there's no bathymetry, there, there's no landmarks, um, there's no nothing out there, but they, they literally go to the same place and have since 2001, since we first put the first tags on them, they've been going to the exact same place every year. And then they come back exactly to the same place that they started from, which uh, to me is just incredible because they're, they're in this like nebulous, I guess, in terms of our sensory systems, this like nebulous environment, right? They're in blue water as far as you can see, as far as you can smell, they go across currents, they go across all sorts of things. So there, to me, that, that ability to navigate so predictably year after year is, it's incredible when you sort of really think about the mechanics of how that happens. So that's, that, that's what I find. I mean, all these other things are really cool as well. I mean, really anything we learn about them is in, in my mind is really fascinating. Uh, speaking of the cafe, uh, do you think they are meeting in the cafe to breed uh, in order to mix with other Pacific populations, uh, for example, from Hawaii? So the animals that are in Hawaii, the animals that are in Mexico are all the same. Yeah, they're all the same. Um, 
population, genetically distinct population. Um, it, it could be, it, but the, the, the interesting thing is that all of those animals also um, interact along the coast uh, or have the potential to interact. So it's, you know, they could, we do have crossover from sharks that are in central California, um, go down to Mexico, Mexican sharks come up through central California. They've been detected up here so that, you know, sharks are able to, to migrate north and south. So it's still interesting why those animals would be going offshore to do that. And they don't mix with the, let's say the Japanese sharks, the sharks that are in the Northwest Pacific, they don't mix with those at all. So um, yeah, it's very, very strange. And all the sharks that have ever been identified in Hawaii are sharks that we've known from, from the, the West coast. So um, they, any shark that have been there have also been here. So I don't think that's like the unique place that they meet because we know that they move around enough that they'd be able to meet here as well. So we don't know, but all of these are great ideas because we're, we're still trying to understand it. I think maybe lastly here, a comment that probably goes uh, for all of us. Uh, I'll read it from Libby. It says, thank you again for your soapbox speech, Taylor. <laughs> Appreciate you demystifying sharks and talking about how humans harm them much more than they harm us. Well, thanks for the comment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, just letting, letting me soapbox for a, minute, a few minutes and embellishing my um, my need to, 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 to talk about sharks and how really important they are. And, you know, it really is, uh, we're, we're in such a wonderful, beautiful place here that the part of these marine systems are, are, you know, are really heavily maintained by these big predators. So we're very lucky to have them. So next time you go out to the coast, just think about all the wonderful things that are down there, keeping this, these, these oceans, and these marine systems healthy for us. And it's, it's our responsibility to, to do everything we can to help as well. Thanks, Taylor. It's a really amazing presentation. And if everyone wasn't muted, you'd hear a roar of uh, applause. So you have to use your imagination on that. Well, thanks. So, uh, Thank you. I, th I think we're done. I just wanted to briefly mention uh, that um, Chrissy mentioned at the outset that in a normal year, we'd be doing 40 uh, in-person programs covering all, all aspects of life around Detarts Bay. Um, that's not, that has been happening in the last year, but uh, we are hoping by July to start start getting back to those in-person programs. So if you're interested in other topics, and there's a really a, a plethora of them, check our website, uh, NITARTS. Uh, we really have two NITARTS Bay today uh, and uh, NITARTSBayWebs.org. Um, and we'll, we will be posting our, our programs there if you're interested. Uh, thanks again for tuning in today. I think we're, Chris, unless you have something else, Chrissy, I think we're done. Yeah, no, um, the only other last thing is that we're still running our um, beach cleanup bingo. So if you would like to get out and help clean up our ocean uh, beaches, um, we welcome you to do that and play a fun game of bingo while you're at it. We have a bunch of really great prizes left, including gift certificates to the schooner, um, professional uh, prints from photographers that have donated, books from Salty Raven, um, lots of really fantastic uh, prizes. So get out, clean up the beach. It's really easy. Um, submit a bingo card and a picture of your trash and we're entering you to win. Okay, again, thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next time.